All right, guys, this is chapter four in the Amsco book. So the chapter focuses on Jefferson and Madison presidencies, 800 to 1816. This is the beginning of Unit 4. All right, so in 1796, uh, Jefferson actually loses the presidential can election to John Adams. Um, very heated campaign, um, only lost by three electoral votes. Remember the parties, right? John Adams is a Federalist, and Jefferson is a Democratic-Republican. In 1800, though, he is going to win. He actually ties with Burr, um, another Republican, um, but that tie is broken in a, in a vote. Uh, so Jefferson does become the president, and it's a change. It's a major change politically. So in terms of essay writing, you know, in 1800, we see, you know, uh, a, a transfer of power from the Federalist Party, right, a strong central government um, philosophy to, um, you know, uh, a different philosophy, right, more of that um, smaller central government. So a lot of, you know, Federalists were concerned. That, that Jefferson would come in and change everything, and he actually didn't change a lot. Um, so it's called the revolution, you know, it's a political revolution. So um, again, there was this bitter fight over the years between Federalists and Republicans. Remember, you know, Adams, uh, to kind of limit uh, Federalist opposition, um, you know, uh, supports a congressional effort, um, or at least supports the, um, the Alien Sedition Acts, right? Um, where if you criticize the other party or the president, you could be jailed. So that's pretty significant. Um, so the House does elect Jefferson at a, after a narrow co electoral college vote. Um, he actually, Hamilton was, was uh, a Federalist who actually, you know, basically convinced um, his, his, you know, his, um, you know, uh, Federalist supporters to actually vote for Jefferson. And remember, they didn't always get along, but... Hamilton did did prefer Jefferson over Aaron Burr. Um, it's it's believed that that's one reason why Burr eventually um, shoots and kills Hamilton in a duel. It is a bloodless transfer of power. Uh, there were Americans that were afraid that there would be riots and that you know we you would have a a, a major um, battle on your hands, almost like a civil war. But this 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 peaceful transfer of power um, was evidence that that our country could transfer power from one party to another orderly and peacefully. Um, so, you know, this is kind of where we're at in 1800. Um, remember, this is, uh, you know, the, the original 13 colonies. Um, you're going to see more territories um, become states during this time, like Ohio in 1803. You know, Americans are going west and they're settling. Remember the Northwest Ordinance, allowed, you know, had a process for this. Uh, slavery is abolished north of the Ohio River. That's important. Again, that's the Northwest Ordinance that was established in the Articles of Confederation. So America is growing um, demographically. Um, we are growing literally, uh, you know, size-wise. We're, we're moving further west. Um, All right, so let's talk about, you know, Jefferson's accomplishments in terms of foreign affairs. So definitely remember the, the, the Louisiana Purchase. 1801, he purchases uh, basically this territory all through here, right, beginning with Louisiana, um, from France. Um, really, the, the point would be to expand the, the, the size of the country uh, access natural resources, grow agriculture, right? Wasn't that the Democratic-Republican principle? You know, America should be a, a nation of farmers, and he saw this as an opportunity to grow farming. Uh, he also believed that having um, control of New Orleans would, would benefit trade, right? If you have, if you control the city, you can you kind of control the Mississippi River and what goes in and out. Um, th there was a controversy, though. The Constitution did not say specifically that a president could purchase land. So Jefferson does this, um, and it does go against his strict constructionist belief. So he was a little, bit of a hypocrite here, but he did believe that it was necessary, that, hey, all right, you know what, it's not in the Constitution, but this is only, this is for the good of our country. Um, Federalists kind of used that against him. Um, Federalists were also concerned that it would just encourage the growth of slavery, um, there was this fear that um, as, as more 
you know, as more states came into the union that were dominated by Democratic Republicans, politically speaking, you know, Federalists would, would lose that power in the Senate, right? You get two senators per state. So there was also this fear of losing political power, right? More territory equals more state. If, again, the, the, the political leaders were Democratic Republican, um, those Federalists would, would be unable to pursue Federalist policies, right? Like pro-British policy or uh, increased tariffs or taxes on transportation, anything like that. So it was a political battle. Um, they believed it was a, um, you know, uh, there, there, there were calls um, for, for uh, leaving the Union, right? Some Federalists were really concerned about this, especially in New England. Um, Lewis and Clark were obviously um, uh, hired to explore that territory. So kind of understand, you know, the basic history of it. But definitely this is important, how he kind of violated, Jefferson violated his own beliefs. Um, and also be aware of federal opposition. Um, some people just, some federalists didn't like it because it was Jefferson and they just didn't like Jefferson. Um, they didn't want to give him credit for, you know, probably a, a pretty good idea. All right, and that's the impact right here. You know, it doubles the size of the United States, right? But again, the question's going to be going forward. What do you do with these territories when they become states? Do you allow slavery? Um, you know, this is the line. The Ohio River is the kind of north-south line, right? What do you do? Um, you know, what do you do with territory here in Iowa and Mi Missouri? Do you allow slavery to grow? So that's going to be the issue. Uh, I mean, the Louisiana Purchase led to the Civil War, but it, it intensified this political um debate over what do you do with new territory in terms of slavery. Do you abolish it? Do you legalize it? Or do you give the people in those states the power to choose? All right, so let's talk about other foreign policy issues. There were these pirates. They're, they're North African you know, mercenaries who were attacking merchant ships off the coast of North Africa, going all the way back to Washington and Adams. They didn't do anything. They refused to pay tribute, kind of a payoff. Um, but Jefferson actually took naval action, which is interesting because as president, he wasn't pro-military. He actually wanted to uh, limit the size of the army um, and navy. So um, he's actually going to, again, kind of go against some of his viewpoints and engage in military action. Um, 1801 to 1805, very limited success. The, the pirates were not defeated. They were maybe slowed down a bit, but at the end... Probably the, what, what was gained is that our Navy became highly respected in, in, in the, on the world stage. All right, um, you know, what's happening during this time? France and England are, are at war. Napoleon is in power. Um, these were the Napoleonic Wars. So both countries continued to kind of harass our ships, right? They wanted us to take a side, and we wouldn't take a side, going all the way back to, to Adams. Um, there was anti-French sentiment on the Federalist side, and there was anti-English sentiment on the Democratic-Republican side. Um, England was considered the, the chief offender. They were impressed, and they were attacking merchant ships, kind of kidnapping or impressing or forcing our merchant sailors to be in the uh, British Navy, so that was angering us. There was also the Chesapeake Leopard Affair. Really simple, 1807. A British warship fired on an American warship, the USS Chesapeake, and that, again, we didn't, Jefferson held back, he didn't go to war, but it continued to fuel anti-British sentiment, and there were calls for war, so there was pressure on Jefferson to do something. He instead focused on diplomacy and economic action, and that would come uh, in the form of the embargo. This is a, a really important um, event. Um, this was destructive to our country economically. It basically said that merchants could not trade with any European nation. We had to be neutral with all nations, Spain, Portugal, England. Basically, don't do any trading. Um, short term, that was terrible for our economy. Obviously, if you had an export business, um, you know, tobacco or, or, or lumber, um, you weren't too happy with that, especially New Englanders who were manufacturers at that time, right? They were maybe in the business of, of sending lumber or some manufactured goods, like some textiles per se, uh, finished goods, maybe even like alcohol. But um, So long term, though, it did help us because it forced Americans to basically start making their own goods. Remember, we're buying textiles and clothing from England. Well, now 
we don't have any trade with them, so it forced us to develop our own economic um, industry, which was helpful long term. We talked about the anti-English sentiment, Western war hawks, um, mostly by Republicans living in the West. Um, one reason is because England, the English government was, you know, there were still, there were still, you know, we talked about in, in, in Jay's treaty, right, that that was an issue where um, Washington wanted um, the English to get out of Canada, or, or at least, you know, out of present-day Michigan and Ohio. Um, that territory was ours, but it really wasn't being governed. So the English were still kind of had some influence there, and they were encouraging native attacks on Western farmers. So again, there were calls for war by, um, by um, you know, uh, these, these Democratic Republicans. All right, um, so uh, what about domestically? You know, things you want to remember would be, you know, the Embargo Act was, 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 was connected, you know, internationally, but it did have an impact, obviously, on our own economy. Um, other things that J Jefferson did, he suspends the Alien Sedition Acts, right? That was important. He also supports a campaign of impeachment for partisan federal judges. So at that time, the, the Supreme Court was dominated by Federalists, or the federal court system, uh, and it was believed that some of those judges were biased in their, in their decisions. So um, the House of Representatives actually does impeach Samuel Chase with Jefferson's support. The Senate doesn't, uh, doesn't continue that impeachment. They um, end it. Um, but it, it, it did change the court in that just the threat of impeachment did cause judges um, on both sides to be more cautious and more neutral, less partisan. So, you know, this did have a positive impact long term. Uh, a very famous court case would be Marbury versus Madison. Um, again, this is a court case that changed the role of the federal court. So Jefferson comes in and he orders his Secretary of State, James Madison, to not file paperwork that Adams had put through for Adams' own judicial appointments. Remember, a president can choose federal judges on the Supreme Court and at the lower levels. Um, this was done right before Adams left the presidency, and the paperwork hadn't been, you know, officially processed. So when Jefferson gets into the presidency, he orders Madison to kind of tear up the paperwork for one of Adams' appointments, whose name was Marbury. So it literally is a, a paperwork issue. Um, so the paperwork wasn't filed, it wasn't finalized, so Marbury never got the appointment, and Jefferson then put in someone else's name. Like I said, it's a timing issue. Kind of silly, right? Um, Marbury actually sues and takes Madison to court, and Marbury and his lawyer cite one of the judicial acts that was established during the, um, during the um, Washington presidency. And it basically stated that the court could actually could intervene in an executive matter and actually force a president to do something or take some kind of action. Um, that's not the case anymore, and here's why. Because um, the head of the Supreme Court at the time was John Marshall, very important person to remember, and he and his judges actually denied Marbury's appeal. They actually said Marbury did not have a case. Marbury could not sue and force Jefferson to give him the job. Why? Because they decided that that Judicial Act was actually wrong and unconstitutional. And that's the point of Marbury versus Madison. It's not about whether Marbury gets his job or not. It's about the Supreme Court set a precedent. They now looked at congressional laws and the court decided and will continue to decide whether or not an act of Congress is constitutional or unconstitutional. Um, it basically said that the federal court... Um, in this decision that the, the Judicial Act was unconstitutional because the, the Supreme Court or a federal court can't limit the power of a, of a president. Only Congress can do that. So it basically established the idea of judicial review. Basically, it, 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 it set up the, the, the purpose and the job of the Supreme Court, which was only to look at law and decide if laws were, were, were legal or, or not legal or constitutional and unconstitutional. So remember this court case, it's very important. It strengthens the power, or at least outlines the powers of the Supreme Court, which is basically to review law, not tell a president what he can and cannot do. All right, uh, what else did the Marshall Court do going forward? They had a huge legacy. 
Um, again, they established the idea of judicial authority or review in Marbury versus Madison. They also strengthened the powers of the federal government, the, the federalist ideology. Uh, they asserted the idea of a national government that was supreme or dominant over the states. They reinforced the idea of kind of a, a national system, uh, a national government where, again, the three branches of government are more powerful and the, the constitution is more powerful than the state government or the state constitutions. So there are three cases you want to remember, McCullough versus Maryland. Basically, um, uh, the state of Maryland wanted to tax the Bank of the United States in Maryland, and the Supreme Court said, can't do that. A state cannot interfere in a federal bank. Can't tax it, can't regulate it. That's up to the federal government. Um, again, it strengthens the power of the, the federal government, um, especially in this case, in terms of you know um, issuing you know or, or, or running a bank, uh, you know a federal bank. Uh, in Gibbons versus Ogden, uh, very simple. Uh, the state of um, uh, of New York was trying to tax. Um, um, a a ship a a, um, a steamboat company that was going back and forth between New Jersey and New York, um, and basically uh, the law said the state of New York could not do that; that only the federal government could um, regulate trade between one state or another. Remember that goes back to the Articles of Confederation, where there was no regulation of interstate trade. Well, the federal government now regulates that, and the states can't get involved. The states cannot tax. Or, or at least regulate um, a, a steamship company that is trading um, between one state and another. If it was just trading between one part of New York and another, that would be different. But it's an interstate trade situation. So that's Gibbons versus Ogden, and again, McCullough versus Maryland. Try to remember uh, at least one of those to, again, as evidence that the court, the federal court was strengthening the powers of the federal or national government. Um, one more little law. Um, the court also uh, strengthened the rights of individuals, you know, our own uh, civil rights or, or, you know, our constitutional rights from states. Um, the case was called Fletcher versus, um, two cases, Fletcher versus Peck and Dartmouth College versus Woodward. It basically protected private property from state seizure. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of the case, but if you see these court cases on a test, again, it's it's the war, it's the martial court strengthening the powers of not only the national government, but in this case, our own private property rights from the states. Um, overall, the the war the the, the martial court um, contributed to the development of a, of a strong national economy. Right, especially with interstate trade, um, and obviously strengthen the powers, or at least reinforce the powers of the central government over the states. And there's John Marshall. He is the head of the Supreme Court. His vote doesn't count any more or less than the other eight judges, but he was kind of the leader, and he kind of drove the discussion. Um, his decisions or his writings were very important in terms of guiding future Supreme Court. So, and he was a Federalist. He was a Federalist. So um, he wasn't biased. He just believed that um, the, the central government had to kind of be supreme over the states. So his name is John Marshall. All right, James Madison comes to the presidency in 1808. He, too, is a Democratic Republican, so we have our second Democrat. Um, he also continued to at least try to maintain neutrality, but he did kind of get us basically into war. So there's a change here. Under Madison, we are no longer neutral. We actually fight uh, the War of 1812. He does try to um, you know, use diplomacy early on. Uh, he supports the Non-Intercourse Act of 1809. Remember, Congress passes that act, and he will uh, ratify it or approve it. Uh, this basically said the U.S. could trade with all nations except for England and France. So he's trying to appeal to those merchants you know, or con try to try to help the economy a little bit, but still he keeps England and France at bay. And then Macon's Bill Number Two, um, a little more controversial because it basically said that the U.S. would actually reopen trade, or or side with one of the two groups, um, or whoever, whatever country was the first to agree to respect our trade rights, we would then begin to trade with that country, and we would promise to prohibit trade 
with that other country. So if England came to us first, we would basically side with England, not militarily, but we would continue to trade with them, and then we would continue our embargo with France. Well, what actually happened um, with Macon's Bill Number 2, um, Napoleon actually agreed to this um, uh, this act, this bill, and we began to trade with, uh, with France, and we placed an embargo against England. Unfortunately, the French uh, didn't um, really do a very good job. They continued to kind of attack our soldiers or impress our, 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 our sailors. So it was basically a failed bill. But it's an attempt to kind of reduce tensions, but um, it kind of didn't do that. And it's really a break from, from neutrality, right? We did come to an agreement with France to side with them, at least um, economically. All right, so the War of 1812 breaks out. Uh, it is a war with England again. Um, the war was fought on American soil. The uh, English came to the United States. They burned down Washington, D.C., and eventually were defeated um, in, a, in a famous battle in Baltimore where the Star Spangled Banner was written. Um, what are the causes? Um, obviously, it's, 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 you know, decades of tensions between the English and the United States over the impressment of sailors, the blockading of ports, and also those frontier pressures where the British were kind of instigating tensions with settlers. But deep down, I think Madison and, and the Democratic Republicans wanted to expand our boundaries. They saw an opportunity that if we defeat or at least, you know, uh, defend or, or limit, you know, uh, a takeover, we could maybe make a deal and access more territory in British Canada and Florida. Um, not everyone was on board. Uh, every war we had had opposition, right? Loyalists opposed the American Revolution. Um, you know, other than maybe World War II, and even in World War II there was some opposition. Um, so Federalists from the North were very opposed to this, one, because they were still wanting to trade with England. They sought out trade with England, mostly merchants from New England, right? They had, uh, you know, small factories. Um, they were, you know, lumberers. They were shipbuilders. These are all Democratic Republicans as well, right? So think of these as, uh, you know, Federalists and maybe Democratic Republicans from New England. They were called quids. Um, they were making money, and they didn't want to see that profit cut into. So there were calls for secession by New Englanders especially, um, why else were we against um, the war? Why were you know Federalists against it? Uh, you know we were a Protestant country, and England was also a Protestant country. So we saw this as a um, you know we had a brotherhood in a sense. Um, how could we go to war with other Protestants? They also believed it was just again a Republican scheme to get more land, um, expand you know uh, uh, that power. Right? Um, new territory means. More states, more states means more senators, more representatives who can promote your, your democratic republican beliefs. All right, so what was the legacy of the French in any war? The effect? Um, we, 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 we were successful. We, 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 you know, we won the war. Uh, we gained the respect of other nations. We had defeated England for a second time. Our, our army and our navy had been strengthened and were proven to be effective. Um, Canada... Um, you know, the English kind of, you know, established more specific boundaries along the Canada-U.S. border. Um, so we're going to see less influence going forward um, or less instigations of Indian wars between England and, um, and the, uh, the, uh, the Indians. Uh, this is the end of the Federalist Party. Because of their kind of unpatriotic, unsupportive views, um, very few people going forward wanted to be uh, synonymous with the Federalists, and that's important. This is the end of the Federalist Party. Um, down the road, though, uh, you know, hypocritically speaking, those same Democratic Republicans will become Democrats, Southern Democrats, and they will kind of, you know, use the same ideas when they want to go to war. Uh, they will talk of secession. They will talk about nullifying, um, you know, constitutional amendments or executive orders. Um, so, you know, they, they, they will forget um, that they too will, will, you know, conduct the same behaviors. Um, and American Indians, without the support of the British, they would be very, um, you know, they would be very vulnerable. And from this, for, this point forward, they're going to be pushed further west. And treaties are going to definitely um, help frontiersmen and not those native peoples. All right, um, that's it, guys. We'll do John Quincy Adams next lecture. Thank you.